question for employers about um, now that we are open in, in varying capacities, um, trying to bring people off of furlough back to work and, and getting some resistance, some justified, some probably not. Um, so one of the issues that we seem to be dealing with routinely are, are, are really twofold. One, employees that um, are taking the position that they've been advised by a healthcare professional not to return to work. Um, as a result of um, perhaps being in a, in a sort of one of those vulnerable employee type positions where they're at increased risk to contracting coronavirus and to the, you know, the situation where, which is, which is a reality where, you know, schools are closed or daycares or day camps are closed due to COVID and they don't have the provider to take care of their child and that they, they need to remain out. So, um, you know, the, the, the situation that we're we're really seeing a lot is is that first one where you've you basically have reopened um, and uh, have have given your employees a specific return to work date. What we're advising is obviously to do that in writing to provide your your employees with a definite return to work date in that letter, um, but then also you know. Um, give them the opportunity to to advise you that they can't return to work for any particular reason. Um, and what we're seeing is letters coming in, just like I mentioned, that, you know, I, I, I've got my letter, I can't come back to work because, um, you know, my healthcare provider is, is advising me to, to self-quarantine as, as re, you know, for coronavirus-related concerns. And this causes a little bit of, uh, of, a, of an overlap because that is a legitimate reason to provide paid sick leave under the Family First Corona Response Act. It's also a legitimate reason to remain out on, on at least under federal unemployment uh, under the p pandemic unemployment assistance. Both of those, um, those um, provisions well, have a have an exception for someone who's been advised not to return to work by a healthcare provider or to self quarantine. So what we're advising is is really same as we did a couple of weeks ago when we last spoke. It, you really have to address these situations on a case by case basis. Get get the those employees back to work that you can, who accept the return to work date. Advise them that they need to notify the Department of Labor that they've been given a return to work date. Um, and, and get them back. For those employees that are, are balking, so to speak, you need to look, you know, to sort of talk with them on a case-by-case -case basis and, and see whether any kind of further accommodation is warranted. It, it could be that they're entitled to additional unemployment benefits. And the interesting thing is, is that they're probably not entitled to unemployment under state law for that reason, but they they, they most likely are entitled to unemployment under the pandemic unemployment assistance under under federal law. So you can approach it really two ways. Um, if they refuse to return, uh, you can notify that, as we talked about, you can notify the Department of Labor that you've provided a, a return to work date and an employee has refused to return and you can give the reason um, that you know they're refusing to return to work because they've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to COVID-related concerns. Um, doesn't have to be that specific, but you can be that specific. And then basically the Department of Labor will then take over and sort of, uh, they'll, they'll hold a hearing to determine eligibility for unemployment. Um, but I think you're in a much better place to, um, to either discontinue the employment or to convert, you know, uh, as a, a temporary layoff or a furlough to a permanent layoff if you provided that notice, uh, given them that opportunity to come back, and then they've they've been unable to return to work due to due to one of those explanations. Um, the other one we're seeing quite a bit of, and I was I was just dealing with this right before this call, is the the continued unavailability of of schools and daycares. Obviously, a month ago we were talking just about schools. But now uh, into the summer months, uh, if, a, if a day camp is closed or a daycare provider is closed or someone, your, your typical daycare provider can't um, care for the children as a result of COVID, um, that's going to you know, provide a basis for that individual not to, uh, not to come back 
to work, at least you know, for an extended period of time under the Family First Corona Response Act, the, um, under the extended family medical leave. So same thing as the paid sick leave, it's important to address those on a, on a case by case basis, actually talk to your employees, you know, communicate with them, uh, be patient, uh, document that conversation really well, and either, you know, agree to sort of some further accommodation, some further um, continued uh, unemployment. And in, and in some situations, we're even advising that, it, you know, that you can convert a, a temporary furlough into a permanent layoff. And, and one way to sort of soften that blow would simply to say, look, we've got to, we're back to work. We need to, we need our employees back. If you can't come back, that's fine. You can stay on unemployment, but I, we can't guarantee you that, you know, the position's going to be available for you, you know, at the end of the day. So, you know, please contact us. And if we have a, a position for which you're qualified, we'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, so that's, that's a real sort of, uh, area where we're getting a lot of back and forth and, and it seems to be an issue for, for many, many employers um, as a result of sort of those overlapping opportunities. The other area, I'll just say quickly and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Valerie to talk to you about, um, you know, the reopening guidelines. But the other area is, is, is whether employers can test um, their, their employees for COVID. Um, and, you know, some other sort of reentry type issues. The EEOC, as we talked about last time, has continued to sort of um, issue some additional guidelines about what you can and can't do uh, for purposes of, of medical exams under the ADA. They've made it very clear um, that an employer has the right to test employees for COVID. They've also recently made it very clear that an employer does not have the right to require um, an employee to submit to antibody testing. So that for whatever reason, they've made a distinction between those two. One is a medical exam that's prohibited by the ADA, the other is not. Um, but we're seeing a lot of our clients, you know, inquiring about the testing and, and feeling more comfortable if they're able to, to bring the employees into the workplace after being after being tested, and uh, that is specifically allowed under the under the ADA, at least for the time being during the COVID epidemic or, or pandemic. Um, so those are just some sort of hot topic issues that that we're seeing right now. Um, I'm sure if there are questions, I haven't checked the chat, but as, as Valerie sort of talks, I'll, I'll look at the chat room to see if there are any particular questions or be happy to to take some at the end as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about reopening. I know in the past we've kind of gone through all of the workplace guidelines in phase one, so I don't want to just reiterate the same um, guidelines over and over. So I'm going to try to focus on areas that just, I think, uh, warrant reminding and then maybe some new considerations for everyone. Um, for those of you who haven't opened yet, uh, just a reminder that you do need to uh, submit the self-certification that can be done online. Um, and you can also download safety signage to put in to display in your workplace um, so that if you have customers or employees, it kind of helps um, bring them a little bit of peace of mind that you've done that recertification. Um, for determining who will return to work. It's kind of an ongoing issue. It's not just the initial who's going to come back, who's not. Um, you know, you have to cont continue to limit your capacity to 50%. Um, and a lot of workplaces have been um, doing, you know, different days for different people um, in order to keep their employees safe. Um, so that employees are only really interacting with the same group of people daily. Um, we've seen people doing sign-up sheets or Google calendars where employees actually have to go in and request a certain day that they would like to come in or um, if they can do their job virtually, you know, if they want to instead go into the office, you want to make sure you're not going over that 50%. Um, so that's a, just one idea of a way that you can try to keep uh, your 50%, but also um, allow people if they need to get items from their office or if they prefer to take a certain call or webinar from 
um, their workplace, then you can do so safely. Um, it's important to um, implement policies and procedures. We've talked about that in the past, just about reopening and making sure that you are in compliance with all the uh, cleaning guidelines. Um, but it's also important as you go forward to make sure employees are continuing to follow those things, the guidelines, and also that they know that they can go to one's key contact if they have any concerns. There's, as Chris said, there's definitely going to be things that come up over time. Um, it's important for one or more of, um, of your administrators to keep kind of on top of these, uh, ch these changing issues and protocols and just have someone who um, is a point of contact and so that you can uh, maintain consistency with your policies and with the way you deal with employee questions and concerns. Um, you should also maintain a log of the employees that are on your premises. Um, if, you know, if you are doing a more varied schedule, you should um, keep, keep, uh, keep a log so that you can help with contact tracing in case there is a COVID diagnosis in your workplace. Um, and in that respect, um, Chris mentioned that um, you can take your employees' temperatures. Um, you can also ask your employees about whether they are experiencing any symptoms of COVID, um, of which are fevers, chills, repeated shaking, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, uh, loss of taste or smell. Um, in the past, it's kind of been iffy about how much an employer can really inquire into an employee's health, um, health record, but the ADA has acknowledged that employers can ask these questions. This may be something that you want to do on a daily basis, depending on your workforce. Um, but again, all of that information should be um, maintained as confidential, um, separate from the employee's personnel file. And probably don't need to keep information about every employee who comes and says they have no symptoms, but if there is a symptom, it's probably something worth noting and keeping, uh, keeping in, in the file. Um, then another area that I thought would be uh, good to discuss would be responding to a COVID diagnosis. So if you have, if you are informed by an employee that they do have, they tested positive for COVID, um, the CDC has provided guidelines for the non-essential employers of what to do. Obviously, this is different if you're in the healthcare field or if you're an essential business, um, but these are for more of the run-of-the-mill businesses um, that we've been talking about every, every week, you know, the non-essentials that are reopening now and starting um, to get back in, into business. In most cases, the CDC says you don't have to shut down your entire workplace or facility. Um, if it has been less than seven days since that employee has been in the facility, all you have to do is close off the areas used for any prolonged periods of time and do cleaning and disinfectant. Um, the CDC says to wait 24 hours um, after the infected person leaves um, to start cleaning and sanitizing. And that is because it, it decreases the chance of someone getting it, uh, getting exposed um, just by coming into contact with respiratory droplets. Um, during this waiting period, open the doors and windows, increase airflow and circulation. Um, and then the, the next consideration is to um, figure out how you're going to deal with any people they've come in close contact with. Um, it depends on your workspace. Some, um, sometimes an affected employee, it'll be fine because they haven't really been in close contact with anyone. But um, the CDC defines close contact it, as a person that has been within six feet of the infected employee for a prolonged period of time. Um, so you should ask the infected employee to identify all other employees with whom they've been in close contact with for 14 days prior. And um, this list of close contacts, you should then inform those close contacts of the possible exposure to COVID-19. However, taking into account confidentiality, you should not disclose the name of the individual who um, had exposure to COVID-19 um, 
a lot of times employees will be will will know just by word of mouth like that someone in their office or in their workspace has it but otherwise you don't want to be responsible for disclosing that confidential medical information so you just tell your employee that there is a possible exposure and that they should monitor themselves for symptoms um, the CDC does recommend that um, those potentially exposed close contacts should stay home for 14 days and telework if possible um, while self-monitoring and discussing with their doctor anything they may be feeling. Um, if you are an essential workplace, uh, there's kind of a different standard. You don't have, you don't have to have those possi possible um, infected employees self-monitor for 14 days. They can continue to go to work, but there are more stringent considerations they should take with regard to symptoms and taking their temperature. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the return to work workspace um, issues that I think may be coming up as you continue to reopen, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have about these topics. And I think we'll have time for that at the end. So. I will turn it over to Rich. Thanks, Valerie. So good afternoon, everyone. I want to touch base on uh, some of the changes uh, with the PPP program and the new PPP Flexibility Act since the last time we met. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this, um, and I'm going to go over it at a high level and, and hit some highlights that I think might be uh, impacting uh, some of you. Uh, so the PPP Flexibility Program gave some real flexibility, as the name describes, to uh, loan recipients that allowed for uh, several things to change. One was it increased the, um, the number of weeks over which you could use the uh, funds for the uh, purposes provided uh, for payroll and for other business expenses from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So that's basically to the end of the year. Uh, that's a huge relief to some of the summer programs and uh, seasonal businesses that you know, may have gotten the loan early on, but hadn't even opened up yet. Or businesses that have been uh, shut down as a result of COVID related laws, um, but you know, haven't been able to up, uh, get up and running fully uh, yet. So extending that out gives a lot of flexibility to business owners to use those funds appropriately. The law also changed the amount of, uh, and actually codified the amount that should be used towards uh, payroll to be 60% of the overall fund, uh, and that increases the amount that can be used for non-payroll purposes like rent um, and other uh, business expenses uh, to 40%. So 60% uh, payroll, 40% non-payroll. And it also extended the rehire uh, date uh, that you needed to get your uh, employees rehired uh, from June 30th to the end of the year. Um, and, there, and it also gave some flexibilities if you couldn't rehire. So there's a lot of uh, you know, whether it be because of a downturn in the business or a change in the business model, or again, COVID related laws that might have been restricting your ability to rehire a particular employee or, uh, you know, uh, your inability to, to, to kind of get back up to speed. Um, if you can demonstrate that, then um, those rehiring requirements will be uh, lessened. Uh, and then also if you, if it, it for forgiveness purposes, and then Finally, if, um, if you can't get the full amount forgiven or, or you know, the portion that is not forgivable, the repayment of that has been extended from a two-year period of time to a five-year period of time. So uh, in essence, that, that play, uh, PPP for Flexibility Act really did give some flexibility and answered a lot of questions. It still did not uh, resolve a lot of, uh, of the tax-related questions that uh, I'm sure I'm just going to throw on to Jonathan at some point uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't answer questions surrounding, you know, what forgivable expenses or the timing of the forgiveness application exactly. Can you apply before the end of the 24 week period, perhaps? Um, so there's still, still some things that will be coming up as the forgiveness aspect of that works its way through the system. But those are the highlights of the changes of the PPP Flexibility Act. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at in terms of, and again, this is going to land on Jonathan's shoulders probably more than mine, but um, nonprofits are really struggling with how to figure out the use of these funds correctly, uh, since a lot of them receive grants that are limited to certain aspects of their operations, and 
using the PPP funds for those grant related expenses may be, uh, you know, uh, violate the terms of your grant or maybe something that upsets your ability to continue to get the grant. Um, and, and how do you treat that loan and, and the use of those funds? Um, that's really being answered on a case by case basis. But you, if you're a nonprofit, you really need to look at your, your grant funding stream and um, you know, be aware of the fact that you know, your funder might look to you and ask questions about the PPP loan if you got it and you know, you, whether or not it impacts your ability to get that grant refunded uh, going forward. Um, so that's at a very high level, some of the things that we've been looking at from the PPP perspective. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan now to talk about some tax aspects of that. Thanks, Rich. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll keep my comments pretty brief with respect to tax developments. There really is one important tax update to provide, and it has to do with PPP loan forgiveness in particular. So if you remember from our prior webinars, the big tax benefit associated with the PPP loan, we've been kind of hammering this point because it's a really huge tax benefit and it's, it's a kind of a departure from traditionally the way the IRS treats loan forgiveness. And that's that under the CARES Act, uh, it clearly states that if you get loan forgiveness of your PPP loan, the forgiveness does not result in the recognition of income under the tax code. So that's a great uh, benefit because like I said, traditionally forgiveness of loan proceeds has income tax consequences and can result in a tax liability both on the state and the federal level. Um, and then if you remember, we also discussed the IRS notice 2020-32, which uh, dealt a little bit of a blow Unfortunately, we don't have an update yet. I've been monitoring it, um, but that notice states that to the extent you use the PPP loan for otherwise deductible expenses, so um, and, and that loan is then forgiven, while the loan is intaxable, the deductions attributable to the loan are no longer deductible. So if you get PPP funding and you pay utilities and wages and expenses that you would normally deduct to offset your income, you can no longer deduct those if you're going to get uh, loan forgiveness. So that's just an important point to keep hammering because you want to plan accordingly uh, because it could result in um, a tax consequence on the state and the federal level. Um, but stay tuned because uh, many tax professionals are anticipating that there will be legislation that reverses the IRS and the Treasury Department's position on this and will actually allow taxpayers to deduct these expenses because if not, we're going to see a lot of taxpayers who didn't anticipate these consequences get hit with a huge tax bill on the state and federal level. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be quite a surprise and it will also kind of be um, contrary to congressional intent with respect to the whole purpose of the PPP loan program. So now for the main tax update, uh, we've talked about some of the tax credits available to employers. Um, I want to point you to the IRS website. They have a very detailed page. It's entitled New Employer Tax Credits. There's various tax credits available to employers. Um, those who, are, who have employees out on sick and family leave, those who have employees who are out for reasons of caring for someone with coronavirus. So do check that out. Um, but keep in mind that not all of these benefits are available to um, taxpayers who um, are, are seeking PPP loan forgiveness. So there's a bit of a prevention of double dipping there. So just be mindful of that. Um, previously, we've discussed that the CARES Act provided that you can defer the employer share of payroll tax. That's 6.2% of all wages paid during the period March 13th through the end of 2020. And we stated that while you definitely do need to pay these back in two installments, one half in 2021 and one half in 2022, it, it wasn't available if you were getting PPP loan forgiveness. Um, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act that Rich just mentioned that was just passed um, has reversed this a little bit. The act uh, eliminates that part of the CARES Act, which stated that a taxpayer who obtains PPP loan forgiveness may not elect to defer. So based on this change, um, if you get a PPP loan and you're seeking forgiveness, you can also elect to have the 6.2% uh, 
employer portion of payroll tax deferral. So that that was previously under the CARES Act treated as double dipping and and not allowed, but based on the Flexibility Act, you actually can do that now. So that's another great tax benefit in light of this new legislation. Um, yes, you do need to pay it back, but a deferral of tax is always a benefit because why pay now when you can pay later? And again, that's one half of the employer portion, 6.2 in 2021, and the remaining half in 2022. Um, so stay tuned for updates with respect to hopefully the IRS and Treasury Department reversing its position or Congress passing some legislation um, that would actually allow taxpayers to deduct those expenses and avoid uh, an, an unwanted uh, income tax consequence on the state and federal level. That's really all I have in terms of tax updates at this point, but again, take a look at the IRS website for those uh, employer tax credits. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rick DeGallo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to be back with you this week. I'm gonna touch on um, three different topics today. I wanna to talk briefly about um, some additional information regarding uh, fraud claims uh, under the uh, PPP program. Uh, talk a little bit about, again, about business interruption insurance and what you should still be considering uh, going forward. And then talk a little bit about uh, liability waivers for businesses um, as they're opening up. So first with respect to the uh, PPP and fraud claims, uh, the government is still aggressively going after uh, people who either, you know, who committed fraud with respect to, or may have committed fraud with respect to their PPP, um, you know, applications under the CARES Act. There's still, um, you know, Department of Justice um, is issuing, um, you know, press releases and bulletins regarding, um, you know, arrests and complaints that are being uh, filed against people across the country. Uh, and, you know, they're still in the early stages. These are people who, uh, you know, essentially, um, you look at it and wonder, you know, why somebody thought they could get away with this, but, you know, that's what people do. Um, but, you know, a lot of people who just made up businesses, um, they either made up the existence of a business uh, that really didn't exist, or they lie about the number of employees or the expected revenue or things of that nature. Um, and these are in, you know, these are loans that were um, applied for, you know, generally in several, you know, between two and say, you know, $20 million. Uh, so the government's taking it very seriously. Um, and you know are, are looking very aggressively um, at all of these loans. Uh, we talked previously about a safe harbor, the safe harbor uh, for loans under two million dollars, and people should just remember that the only the only safe harbor provision there was with respect to the certification that there was an economic necessity for the loan. Um, all other all other certifications uh, that were made with regard to the the need for the loan, the amount of the loan. Uh, justification for the loan, you know, though none of those fall within that safe harbor. Uh, so the SBA and the Department of Justice and other agencies are aggressively um, or are planning to aggressively go after, um, you know, any fraud uh, for, for loans in any amount. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter that uh, your loan may have been under $2 million if there was any, any potential for fraud in any of the certifications, um, you could be on the hook um, and you need to be careful. The, you know, it's funny, um, you know, you can think about the SBA coming after people for the loans, um, but it's amazing just how many different agencies uh, become involved uh, when they go, when they're, you know, with these enforcement actions. It's, it's on the national, the state, and the local level. Uh, police departments get involved, the IRS, the SBA, the Department of Justice, the FBI. Um, there's really, you know, they're really pulling out all the stops when it comes to these. Uh, another thing to consider as we're going forward and as Rich discussed was, you know, now that people, um, you know, in the next, you know, coming up in the next several months will be applying for forgiveness. Uh, there's another opportunity uh, for the government to look at fraud with respect to uh, how people go about claiming the forgiveness. Um, you know, again, you have to certify that a certain portion of the funds were used to either to pay for payroll or utilities or other covered expenses. Um, you know, if you're making those certifications and it turns out that the monies were used for other things, uh, then that's another example or a possible fraud, uh, which could lead to, you know, both civil and criminal penalties in that regard. So again, you need to be very careful, uh, both in the application uh, that was submitted and then again, in asking for the forgiveness, uh, you know, there's a um, you know, serious potential uh, for, uh, for getting into, into trouble uh, with regard to these loans. So be very careful and, you know, again, as we've, we've talked about in the past, one of the most important things you can do is you really have to keep good records. 
uh, when they do these investigations, they sometimes require people to turn over all their records within within days. Um, you know, they can issue saying, you know, we want all your records within the next two days. We want them within the next week. So it's, um, you know, you don't have time to go and try to pull things together uh, once we, you know, once a government investigation starts. Uh, so your best bet is to just keep track as you're going along um, of all your records. And again, you know, the worst thing that could happen is if you're doing everything right, and then you, it turns out you don't have the proper documentation, uh, which could be a problem. So just make sure that you, you keep your records. Um, you don't need to necessarily keep separate accounts um, of the money, although that's probably not a bad idea uh, just for, for ease of uh, record keeping. Um, but just keep track of the payments you make, you know, the uses of the money, you know, where you put the money how, and how, you know, how it was paid. Um, you know, we've seen, I think I talked about this last time, but you know, there was someone, I don't know if you're a Hollywood producer, um, you know, who went out and paid off, you know, credit card debt and, um, you know, car loan with the money. Uh, that, that's not a good idea. So you want to be able to keep track of, you know, exactly what you use, uh, what you use the money for. Um, so that's what, you know, that's with regard to the uh, potential fraud. Um, business interruption claims, we talked about that before. Uh, generally, this is insurance coverage, which you would have if you had to shut down your business uh, for certain reasons, and then you can recoup some of your lost profits and, and things of that nature. Uh, there are a lot of exclusions uh, to those to business interruption claims um, in policies. You know, uh, there's usually a virus exclusion. There could be a pandemic exclusion. Uh, there's also a you know there's also usually a necessity for physical property damage. So in other words, these these policies generally kick in if you're you've uh, experienced water damage to your facility, or your place of business, or uh, fire, something of that nature, which close you know which forces you to shut down. Uh, again, I just want to emphasize that if you think you have a business interruption claim, just put your put your broker, put your insurance company on notice. Um, these are uh, the you know these are not typical. Um, there's there's already been several hundred lawsuits filed against insurance companies to recover these monies. Uh, there haven't been any decisions made yet, but there's uh, potential for legislation. There's a potential that these uh, that businesses may end up covering some of these. Um, there could be different interpretations of how the exclusions work. You know, this is, uh, you know, as we've all said, this is a, a new situation for everyone. Uh, it's a new situation in, in being quarantined. It's a new situation uh, for how these insurance, you know, for how these uh, policies are interpreted. Uh, you know, they did not anticipate um, a worldwide pandemic and then an entire economy being shut down. So again, you know, in terms of things that you can do just to put yourself in a good position, just like keeping good track of your records with regard to your loans, you know, but just put your insurance company on notice and keep track if you, th if you think you lost money. Um, you know, even with the, uh, you know, with the riots and other the protests and the riots that have been going on in the last several weeks, um, you know, while there certainly hasn't, Connecticut hasn't seen uh, the type of destruction or damage um, that other places have seen, you know, if your business ends up being interrupted for some of those reasons, there could be insurance coverage available for something like that. Um, some policies will, you know, will allow you to put in a claim if your supply chain is disrupted. So if uh, riots or protests in another part of the country, uh, you know, impacted a business that you do business with and you're unable to get, you know, things that you, you know, things that you need, materials that you need to do your work, you know, there's a potential claim there as well. So, you know, in, in, in times like this, you really need to, you know, make an effort to think out of the box if you think that you have a possibility to recoup some monies. So it's always good to just keep these different things in, in mind. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about briefly were uh, waiver, you know, uh, liability waivers for businesses that are opening up. Um, you know, we've seen different businesses, um, you know, some great examples that we talked about, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, when the stock brokers went back to work, uh, that they were required to uh, sign a waiver of liability before they went back so they wouldn't hold the exchange liable if they caught the coronavirus. Uh, you know, President Trump had, uh, you know, at his rally uh, this past Saturday night, uh, anyone in attendance had to sign a liability waiver. So, uh, you know, it's not something that's far-fetched. I mean, we've all signed them, you know, um, they generally have to do with recreational activities such as skiing and other things. Uh, but there are, you know, I've seen uh, hairdressers require them, schools, camps, you know, a lot of other places are requiring people to sign those waivers before they come in. And essentially what you're saying is, the, the customers are, the, are holding the businesses, uh, you know, the businesses can't be held liable if someone, you know, uh, frequents the business or is, is a patron of the business and then they can track the coronavirus. Uh, so now these generally won't, uh, 
uh, won't you know businesses won't be held immune for you know any kind of gross negligence or recklessness on their part. This is really just if a simple negligence waiver. So businesses need to make sure that they're following you know to the extent that they possibly can, following all the CDC and state guidelines for how they're reopening. You know what they're doing to keep the businesses clean, what they're doing to keep the numbers of uh, customers and employees to the required, you know, 25 or 50 percent, whatever it is. So it's important that businesses follow those guidelines. Um, but if you want to add a, a little added layer of protection, you can certainly have someone, <clears throat> you have an attorney draft a liability waiver for you and have people sign it before they come in. Again, this is something new. Uh, I don't think any courts have issued decisions on whether these liability waivers are enforceable. Uh, Connecticut takes a very strict look at these uh, waivers. Uh, they really, they can't be in violation of public policy, uh, which can mean a whole host of things. There could be a determination that asking for a waiver during a pandemic violates um, public policy, but that hasn't been a determination yet. Um, there's, you know, one of the big public policy uh, arguments is that, you know, it's tough for employers, uh, and Chris can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's tough for employers to have employees sign liability waivers, especially when there's uh, workers' compensation uh, insurance available uh, for certain things. So, you know, again, something to think about. You don't know whether it's, it's enforceable. It has to be very clear. People have to understand exactly what it is that they're waiving. Um, some of the liability waivers also require people to, you know, indicate that not only will they not sue, um, but that they haven't been in, you know, also indicate that they haven't been in contact with anyone, uh, you know, who's, uh, you know, who has symptoms or that they know has the coronavirus or things of that nature. So, there's a host of um, you know forms and and other things that you can, you know that can certainly be tailored uh, and need to be tailored to your specific business. Uh, what you don't want to do is just go on the internet and pull off a general uh, liability waiver form because the chances of that being in, in, enforceable uh, if it's used for another business or if it's used for uh, in another state uh, is you know maybe much more difficult. Uh, but certainly something for businesses to consider as as we start to open up again. Um, and especially, you know, as we start to increase uh, the amount of customers um, or employees that may be back in the in the office. And I think that's uh, that's all I have on those and happy to answer any uh, any questions that anybody may have. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I, I did have some uh, come in through via email. So I think this one is probably for Valerie. Um, do offices need to take temps of visitors under the reopening guidelines? Um, they're not required to, but they can if they feel better about allowing people in having taken a temperature, but it's not a requirement. All right, perfect, thank you. And then this is probably more for Christopher. Um, so what can an employer do if they have an employee who's just returning from what we consider like a hotbed, like Florida, Arizona, Texas, and they're on vacation? So they're coming back. So what's in within the, the employer's rights as far as when they get back, do they have to quarantine for 14 days? And obviously this is not without the CDC or the governor saying you absolutely have to. This is before that actually happens. So what are the ramifications? What can be done? Um, I've, we've had a lot of questions like that in the past and just two came up today. So uh, I figured I'd pose that to you. Yeah, so is this, um, can you tell from the question whether they're talking about um plain plain yeah plain so this is yeah travel? so this this yeah. one specific person who asked um their employee is actually leaving this weekend on vacation yeah. and yeah. they're going to florida um i don't know where in florida so, but going to florida yeah so it's yeah it's, it's that's a hotbed for sure right now we know that um i mean i, th I think the, the employer is in good in good position to require that employee to to quarantine for 14 days after air travel. Uh, certainly the CDC require, you know, uh, guidelines suggest that. The question is what, you know, who who pays, right? Yeah. And, you know, essentially I, I think that the safest way to handle it is, is because that employee is technically, there's, there's no requirement that they, that they quarantine. Um, so, you know, when we look at that sort of unemployment in its classic form, that that employee is is ready, willing, and able to work, but being sort of precluded by doing so by the employer. So um, I think, but I think the employer can either, um, you know, have the employee use paid sick leave, provide the employee with unpaid leave. 
um, or even, you know, do a temporary furlough, you know, for, for the 14 day period and then let the Department of Labor determine as to whether they're eligible. I think they would be eligible for that because the, you know, as I said, the employee is, is ready, willing and able to come back to work. Um, but the employer is essentially, I think justifiably saying you can't work right now for 14 days. Right. Okay. So with that being said, say the employee comes back and then tests positive for COVID. What do you do then? Yeah. Just I mean, follow the same guidelines as Valerie said before and Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you need to follow those, you know, if you've got a positive test, um, you know, that, that employee can't come into work. Um, you know, they might be entitled in that case to, to the paid sick leave under the okay. Family First Corona Response Act. Um, but then you need to take those, those additional steps that Valerie mentioned in terms of requiring that person to quarantine identifying anybody, you know, that he's been, he or she's been in contact, close contact with and, and get them to quarantine. Um, and then, you know, be careful just to maintain the, con I've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, can we disclose the name of the person who tested positive? And essentially the answer to that is no, yeah. unless that, unless that employee gives you permission to, to do so. And there was a third part to that question. Um, but I think uh, Valerie kind of covered that. So if the employee comes back, it can be requested of the employee to go out and get tested, correct? Correct. Not antibody testing, but uh, COVID testing. That's right. That's what I have. Anybody else on here have any questions? I would just just follow up, Joanna, on the um, on Rick, you know, and, and the liability waivers. That that's yeah, that's really sort of. Um, risky territory, um, you know, to, to require an employee to sign a waiver about the workplace because, and, and again, this is yet to be determined, but generally um, it's against, it's a violation of public policy to have an employee waive a worker's comp claim. And that's essentially what you're having them do by signing a waiver about a possible comp claim due to COVID. So, um, you know, I'm suggesting to clients, um, you know, moving a little bit away from the waivers. I don't think they're going to accomplish that much in the workplace. What you, what some people are doing is, is doing more sort of a recognition of, of consent, you know, that they're, it's almost like the informed consent doctrine in the medical field where you, where you have a patient, you know, sign a piece of paper indicating that they know the risks. <laughs> Uh, you could have employees, you know, put them on notice that, you know, that, that, you know, we're having you come back to work um, and that, you know, there's certain risks inherent in that. But um, I, I just think those, both of those are probably not worth the paper that they're written on, at least in the, in the workplace context. Um, certainly we're doing tons of releases for recreational type activities and things like that. Right. Absolutely. All right. Richard, you want to add anything? No, just following up on Chris, we're doing a lot of releases and waivers in either the recreational setting or the hospitality setting or, you know, the summer camp. I think OEC had some language that they're required to put in uh, these waivers, uh, you know, for summer camp programs. So, but I agree with Chris on terms of the employer employment relationship that, that's kind of fraught with peril, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so just take it, take it for what it's worth in, in terms of the, the usefulness of those. All right, anybody else want to add anything before we close? All right, well, thank you as always, the UPS team. You guys do a great job. I always learn something every time I'm on these meetings, so I do appreciate that. And I know our members truly appreciate this. So thank you. I wish you guys a happy fourth since everybody won't see you before then. And uh, everyone be safe and uh, enjoy. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joanna. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Joanna.